I'm Dr. David Sheard, CEO of Dementia Care Matters. This film has been commissioned by NHS England because dementia care could be really, really different. In the past, in my working past, dementia care was a non-subject where people were treated as if they were not even human beings and warehoused within care services. But over the last 35 years of my life, my mission has been to prove that people with dementia can always be reached and always connected with. And that theme is therefore highly relevant to ambulance service staff across the country. It's really important to hear the voice of people living with dementia and to hear what they have to say about their experience. Memory is um, <laughs> not a lot of good, really. I can remember something, somebody told me something, and I can walk around for a few days and I forgot what he said. That is a part of mine that I, I, I'm very sad about. My memory, I lost it a bit. I can't tell you my wife when I married her. I can't tell you about my kiddies when we're born. My daughters have to tell me that. And that's the saddest thing I could ever think about. That I can't remember where she was. After meeting Doug, it was really clear to me that the biggest experience he was going through was the feelings in relation to his memory loss. The feelings that he couldn't remember his wife, his wedding, exactly where they'd lived and their children. In the war, I could tell you all about when I was called up, who lived, who, who lived in the road, but then I was waiting for my girlfriend to marry her. And that went. I can't remember Marina. I can't remember where we lived, really. where we had kiddies, with my daughter, my boys, my, all my family. And that's an awful thing. People with dementia are more feeling beings than thinking beings. He would let the memories go, but it was then the feelings that really stayed with him of the loss. My name is Kate White and this is my partner John. We've been living with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's was a kind of dementia for about seven years. The great love in our life is music. We've found all sorts of different ways of uh, living with this condition, which has been a challenge but also a joy. What about the memories of the last couple of days? What are they like? <laughs> I probably can't remember. Uh, it's all right, Jan. What, what does it feel like having a problem with the memory? What's the feeling? I think uh, th there's a feeling of, of fear. Uh, if if you're not remembering what where you're supposed to be going and doing. So what's good about life now? Ah, uh, love. Uh, uh, I think that's the biggest. Uh, and best part of life, I think. Hmm? And jazz. Good jazz playing takes a very long time to do. You have to practice a lot. Hmm. Hearing you say that makes me feel quite teary, John. <laughs> Most people living with dementia will struggle with their short-term memory loss. In listening to Kate and John, it was so clear that John struggled with the question, can you tell me what you did the last two days? It produced a silence and a glazing over, and yet immediately when I asked him about how he was feeling, 
he immediately responded about feeling about the love he had for his partner and then his great skills still in jazz. In other words, he'd moved from focusing on thinking to know it's feelings that really matter most. People get muddled up about the word dementia and Alzheimer's disease. The best way to think of dementia is like the word cancer. If someone has cancer, you would say which type. And it's just the same with dementia. Because the way that we portray um, dementia, if we develop it, is dependent upon who we are, what our culture is, what our life experience is, as well as um, the type of dementia. It all depends upon what part of your brain has been affected by um, the, the process. So that when you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. There's, there's no way that you can generalise. When someone says they have dementia or another professional is saying they have dementia, it's an umbrella word and it's really important to say which type. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, but it's also very common to hear words about vascular dementia, about dementia from Lewy bodies. There are many, many tens of types of rarer dementias also. What do you understand by the term the language of dementia? The language of dementia, that's an interesting one. I, I don't know. Oh, completely lost me on that one. It's all right. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I would say that the term the language of dementia might relate to how you're communicating with people with dementia. So do you change your tone, your pace, or do you just talk to them as if they're any other person? If they believe they're a five-year-old child, we have to play along with that. So we have to sort of like play along with whatever time zone they feel that they're in and not try and bring them into our time zone, or we won't, you won't be able to communicate with them. The key message in this series of films is that there is a language of dementia. That when people dementia can't rely on facts, logic, reason, memory, they work from this. The experience of living with dementia is an experience about feelings and emotions more than anything else. That therefore means that the language of dementia shifts from being literal to being a language that's about metaphor, that's about emotion. And it's our job, therefore, to become really good interpreters of what people with dementia are trying to communicate to us. Mum? Mum? Yeah, Mum? If a lady was to phone us, she's in her 80s, she's asking for her mum. For us, we have a big thing in the ambulance service called never judge the integrity of the caller. So if she says she's looking for her mum, for us, we're going to 100% believe that she's looking for her mum at that moment in time because the moment that you think that she's not actually looking for her mum, the ambulance crew are going to turn up and it just so happens that she's in her 80s and her mum still is alive, and then we've judged her and we don't believe that her mum was actually at that scene. If you keep reminding someone who's asking for their mother that their mother is dead, you take them back each time to that initial sense of loss that they have just lost their mother, they've forgotten that their mother is dead, so you make the problem so much worse. A major debate in the field of dementia care is about truth versus lies. Should you go with the person dementia's truth, which may be in a different reality, or should you try and force them back to our reality because you're not prepared to collude with a lie? But that debate is really a dead debate. You can't force logic, facts, reason back into dead neurons in the brain. You have to accept the person with, as they are. You have to be able to go with their reality. And that means believing the words they're saying, but understanding that their words are not literal, that the language of dementia needs to be interpreted so that you go to the feelings behind the words. Have you seen my mum? I haven't no. seen her. I've looked everywhere and okay. I can't find Sorry, her. We'll help you find her, Becky. That's OK. She said Wherever she I go around the world, people living with a dementia after the early stages start saying they're looking for six things. They're looking for their mum, for their dad, for their children, for school, for work and for home. And in my early years in dementia care, I made the same mistakes as many people do now where I thought they were looking for those actual things. Okay. Have you seen her? I haven't seen her today, but we all need our mums, don't we? The mums what brilliant. I now know is that the search is not for those things. The search is inside themselves. 
They're saying, I need the feelings those things used to give me in the past, but I need you to give me those feelings now. I need you to make me feel as loved as my mum. I need you to make me feel as needed as my children. I need you to make me feel at home inside myself. And when ambulance crew are hearing people dementia saying those words, it's a real key indicator of the emotional well-being or ill-being of a person. And what they're giving you a clue as to is help me, reach me, give me those feelings in order that I can feel more safety. In this series of films, we will be emphasising the importance of accepting a person living with a dementia as they are, going with a person's truth and their reality. And interpreting always the feeling behind a person's expression of a behaviour. People living with a dementia can be at risk in relation to their physical, but also their emotional well-being. Ambulance staff can play a vital role in the area of safeguarding in determining whether a person in their own home, in a care home, or on an emergency call appears to be needing further assessment in relation to safeguarding, and this series will look at best practice in this area. Communication is the essence of what matters most in life and yet we know in the world that many of the world's problems are caused by a breakdown in communication and I think that's where we've been in the last 20 years in dementia care. We've had a breakdown in communication because we haven't always known how to reach and connect with people living with dementia. But now we know that although a person with dementia is a unique individual and although they've got their own life history and they've got their own point of experience of dementia, that generally the language of dementia is about feelings first. And therefore ambulance staff have got a real opportunity to lead in this new approach, to be in the moment with people with dementia, to reach and connect by realising feelings really matter most. All of us know when we make a 999 call that it relates to an emergency, it relates probably to a crisis, uh, whether it's police, fire or ambulance, we make those calls when we're needing some urgent help. <coughs> Similarly, when those calls come through to an ambulance control centre, the staff are needing very quickly to get key information. What is the address of the person, the telephone number, what is the medical emergency? But of course that may not be why the person with dementia is making the call. Many people with dementia, as I've described, have moved more into this heightened feeling state where they're more a feeling being than a thinking being. But of course if their feelings are of fear, being lonely and lost, feeling disorientated, panicky, unsafe, not feeling secure, then their mind can say, when you used to feel like that in the past, 999 was the answer. They're the guarantee. They're always the one to help. So some 999 calls may not be about a medical emergency, but maybe about an emotional emergency that the person dementia is currently having. I want 999. Emergency ambulance, what's the address of the emergency? Are you 9999? Hi, oh. Are you going to help me, please? Okay, I'm going to have to get you to try and calm down for me. I need you to tell me exactly what the address of the emergency is. I don't know. Oh, please. 
please help me, please. It's because it, oh, it hurts. It's inside me. Is that 999? Okay, yeah, you've definitely reached the right place. You're through to 999. I'm, I'm here from the ambulance service. With calls for patients with dementia, the kinds of challenges that you face are the, the confused state, so they can't necessarily give you a direct answer. They may not be able to focus on exactly what it is that's happening to them at that moment in time, so they may kind of go off on what's happened to them in their, in their past, so injuries or illnesses why they may have needed an ambulance before, and it's about trying to draw them back into what it is that's happening to them at that moment in time. When we get a 999 call, our call handlers are very focused on getting the location because we need to know where we're sending the ambulance or where we're sending help. The telephone number is something that's very crucial for us, but sometimes that can be quite difficult for somebody who may be suffering with memory loss or with having some confused state. So we would try and sort of take them back to something that's sort of quite familiar. So if they've had a letter through the post, can they read that out to us so they can give us that information? And we would try and make them quite familiar with the surroundings, where are you now, what can you see, what's happening in your house. Are you able to go and find a letter with the address on at all so that we can get you some help? It's locked, it's locked and I can't get out. I just need you to find a letter just so that you can read out what it says on the front. What? No, my mum, my mum, my mum, my mum, my mum should be here. She says she's coming but she's not come, she's not come and the, the door's locked, the door's locked. Help me! Help! It's all locked. I can't get out. Help! <laughs> Are you able to find a letter with the address on or anything like that for me? So, should we head down to the hospital? Yeah, that'll do yeah. for now, yeah. Okay, so you said that's Nassington Road in NW3, is that correct? So we've got a 80-year-old, okay. yeah, 80-year-old female, Nassington Road, NW3. If we were going to dispatch an ambulance to somebody suffering with dementia, especially that was in a confused state and maybe was saying that they didn't want an ambulance, and, and that often happens, we would say to them and give them some reassurance that we were going to assess them in their own home, in the privacy of their own home, in that safety and security. So they felt that they wasn't going to be taken out of their environment to hospital. So we would make sure that that person had the reassurance that the ambulance crew would treat them there at their property, and then we would look at a referral because face-to-face is much easier to deal with than over the telephone. So again, it's just about the engagement first. I understand that you're trying to get in touch with your mum and you want your mum there, but I need to ask you these questions to make sure we get you the best help. Do you have any pain? Is the pain anywhere in particular? You said that somebody's hurt you. What's happened? Whereabouts are you hurting? Are you bleeding or vomiting blood? OK, I'm going to need you to answer the question for me so that we can get you the help. Do you have any pain? Whereabouts is the pain that you have? We wouldn't ask someone without legs to run, so why would we push on facts and questions with people with dementia where that is what they're most struggling with? When somebody dials 999, it's very difficult to see that patient. So we ask a call handler to step into that call and almost visualise it. So when we get presented with somebody who, exactly that scenario, that doesn't have any legs, we can visualise that and we would know their limitations, absolutely. With dementia, I don't think people necessarily know the limitations that, we current, that the patient will be experiencing and that's what we have to learn from. Definitely done the right thing, okay? We have a tool that we use across the board for any kinds of patients, which is a tool called repetitive persistence. So if you've got a phrase, if you use that regularly, so you're saying it over and over again, same tone, same pace, that kind of draws that person back in and it remains their focus back into the situation that you was in at the moment. So for example, if we can get a name, so I need you to calm down Mrs Jones because we're going to get you some help. It may be that we would need to script some more specific guidelines for staff um, and awareness of where we would want people to take that conversation on a 999 call. But I think um, it's certainly something that we need to look at further, without a doubt, because the patient's confidence on a 999 call is the only thing you have. You have two voices and that's what you need to gain their confidence and their trust with ahead of anyone being able to have a face-to-face -face interaction. 
call takers have to work to a script to obviously get the precise information they need. What is the difference in terms of how clinicians can communicate on their calls? Having been both a call taker and now as a clinician, I feel a lot more freedom in the role of clinician because I can ask what I feel I need to ask um, and get to the root of the problem so I'm not stuck to a script that I have to follow. Clinical hub. I can relax the patient because I can ask them things related to what they are worrying about rather than um, having to get stuff in a specific order in order to facilitate the programme that the call takers use. Okay, you've rung us for some help and we're going to try and help you. Okay, I need you to tell me what you can see in your room. I think in the future with the increase of dementia diagnosis um, and the issues faced by the call takers as far as getting information from the patient in quite an anxious state, um, the process is going to be, need to be a lot more fluid um, which is allows a, a less scripted, um, more productive, more relationship based process to let them get the information they need to help these patients effectively. Stay on the phone, keep talking to me. An example of a call that I've taken from a patient with dementia that was quite a difficult one to deal with was an elderly lady phoned me. She told me that her husband was in cardiac arrest at home at the moment. And we went through the process of starting CPR, giving all of those instructions. I could hear furniture moving. She could tell me the receipts that he had in his pocket. So she'd gone for all of his clothing and we, I could hear her actually doing the process of CPR on that patient. And when the ambulance crew arrived, she handed the phone over to them and said, speak to my sister on the other end of the phone. She'll be able to tell you exactly what's happened. When the ambulance crew had arrived, they'd not found a patient, there was nobody on the floor. She wasn't actually doing CPR on anybody, and it was just a confused state that she believed her husband was still there and that he'd gone into cardiac arrest at that moment in time. <laughs> Throughout life, it's quite natural to ask questions when you're seeking more information from people. Is he completely alert? But of course, questions are the thing that people living with dementia are going to struggle most with because they test the brain. It's much easier to allow a person with dementia to take more charge of the conversation. You can do this by saying their words back to them. You can do this by what I call mirroring their language, giving them more chance to have more turns. It's very difficult in a conversation to turn take, whereas people who have dementia are more likely to say more if they have more turns in the conversation. An example would be, you know, if a woman with dementia is talking about her mum, talking about her arm hurting, talking about the locks, to ask her questions like, are you locked in? Do you know where the door is? Is there anybody in the room? Where is your mother? Why is your arm hurting? Which part? That is all brain ache stuff. And it could actually increase anxiety, increase ill being, and lead to the person shutting down more. Whereas actually saying, your mum is coming. You say your arm is hurting. The doors are locked. It's more often giving them back a cue, a prompt, that they will give you more information. Because the more they talk, the more you'll get a clearer picture from them, rather than relying on them to be factual and logical and being able to answer your questions. You want the maximum words from them to get a maximum picture. Here's a summary of the key skills in dementia care. Always assess the feeling in the situation that you have arrived at. Make connection to the person with dementia first. Believe the person and what they are saying, even if it doesn't feel true. Understand their reality may be different from yours, but their reality is very real to them. Look out for control. Controlling care is a feature that creates ill-being in people with dementia. Act on poor care. You have a professional duty of care to report safeguarding concerns. Notice emotions. People with dementia are more feeling beings than thinking beings. Calm tension. People experiencing dementia pick up on the atmosphere and the aura in a situation. Educate everyone that behaviours in people with dementia always have a meaning. 
Following these simple messages will keep all ambulance staff focused on what matters most in dementia care. Help me, help! Oh, come on! <laughs> what we've seen in this film is that the woman in the flat was in a chronic state of anxiety. And in that state of anxiety, it was very difficult initially to establish the truth. She gave some indicators. She talked about her mum. She talked about being locked in and she talked about her arm being hurt. And I would suggest that some, if not all of those things were metaphors for how she was feeling inside. This film highlights the importance of positively connecting first with someone living with a dementia. Why is that first connection so critical? Ambulance staff need to do two things when they arrive on scene. First, they need to understand the language of dementia and adapt their communication to help the person. What is said may not be what is meant. And second, they need to build a relationship with the person before starting on any health care. Clearly, in an emergency situation, this is different. But when arriving at someone's house or care home, where the person is distressed, anxious or frightened, Hello, ambulance. the key to getting the best assessment is to create a calm atmosphere and a relationship based on acceptance, trust and understanding. Oh, 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 this is awful. I who are you? My name's James, I'm from the ambulance service. Oh. Okay? Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Have you seen my mum? No, I haven't seen your mum. No, I've looked. Well, we can help you find her if that would help. I, I have looked everywhere. Okay. She's here, she should okay. be here. She okay. should be here. Because I'm hungry. Of course. She should come. She, should come. she said mm -hmm. she was coming. We'll find your mum and we'll take good care of you, alright? Oh, oh, thank you, okay. thank you. Peggy, oh, shall we have a seat you. on the sofa and have oh. a little chat about what's been going on today? Okay, yeah? okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Come over here, let's have a talk. Okay. There we go. Nice one. Oh, oh. Well, Peggy, tell us what's been going on. Well, it's all the doors are shut. Okay. So they were shut, and I said, well, where's my, where's my mum? She was coming. Who else lives here with you? How come they were locked? I don't know. It's Jack. I think he shuts the door. We've seen that the woman in the flat is in a chronic state of anxiety, that she's moving in and out of different realities. Sometimes she's orientated as to where she is, and then her mind takes her back in the past to a time when she felt safer, needing her mum. At times she knows she's free to go out, and at times she feels she's locked in. All of these things are metaphors for how she's feeling on the inside. What was great to see was the ambulance crew arrived and went down to her level, sat with her. The key goal first was for them to create a relationship with her, to make her feel calm, to make her feel they trusted her, and to not get into whether it was truth or lies, but to actually just help her to feel believed that she was hurting, that she was locked in, that she had not had any food, and that she had been harmed. <laughs> I know, I know. Later, the ambulance crew will be able to establish the facts or the truth behind any of those things. But the key at that point in the 999 call was to reach that woman's chronic feelings of fear inside. How did you decide what actually her reality was and what was the truth? That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, being the first time we've met Peggy, um, 
it makes it more difficult because we don't know the background and any other sort of perspective. So our perspective was very much had to be what she said and we had to take that as, as given and kind of act in her best interests from what the sort of information we were being fed by her. Going forward, we would then try and enforce that back through um, our channel to see if there was any previous information that we could try and make a bit more of a, a pattern and a story behind um, and then try and involve other local agencies and potentially some of her family as well. We've arrived, the front door is open, we've gone down, we've seen this lady it's very agitated so immediately to me mensing goes out and it goes to a social problem we have to calm her down because we can't do any mensing or anything until we've calmed her down. Okay. Tell her, tell her that I'm hungry. Okay. We can get some food for you in a second we can get you a sandwich and something to eat. So when she kept referring to her mum I believe that was to be due to her orientation in time so she kept referring to her as a figurehead as her mum so I believed that she believed that her mum was still alive and was still taking care for her. And that was further impounded by the fact that she talked about her children as being very young and described them in a way that she was still caring for them as children rather than adults. He locks the door so I can't see the little children. He shouldn't do it. It was obvious that her orientation in time was a bit skewed. So it would then be difficult to sort of interpret where what was truth and what was not. That being said, I couldn't disregard anything she said because you, some of it will be, will be fact. So it would then be about trying to piece together the puzzle of what is, what is truth for her and what is truth in reality. For me, this is someone who's, who's having a distress and having a crisis at that time. So it's about me trying to either connect with that crisis so I can understand what's going on and calming her down. You know, no matter what's going on, until she's calm, we can't do anything as an ambulance crew. It's important when um, ambulance crew attend um, a call out that they engage with the reality of the person with dementia because if you want the best response from the person you're en enabling to help you need to be working with them not trying to force your reality on theirs. There was an occasion when the emergency services were called because my husband had become very distressed, agitated. He was frightening uh, staff and they, he was at a day centre so they therefore felt that the other, those attending were also at risk. And uh, whilst the emergency services were informed um, when uh, they arrived that my husband has dementia, uh, they didn't appear to appreciate what would be good, what would help things and what made things worse. If my husband had been allowed to do what he wanted to do, which was to leave, to get out of that environment, he would have calmed down. Throughout life it's quite natural to ask questions when you're seeking more information from people. But of course questions are the thing that people living with dementia are going to struggle most with because they test the brain. It's much easier to allow a person with dementia to take more charge of the conversation. You can do this by saying their words back to them, you can do this by what I call mirroring their language, giving them more chance to have more turns. It's very difficult in a conversation to turn take, whereas people who have dementia are more likely to say more if they have more turns in the conversation. An example would be, you know, if a woman with dementia is talking about her mum, talking about her arm hurting, talking about the locks, to ask her questions like, are you locked in? Do you know where the door is? Is there anybody in the room? Where is your mother? Why is your arm hurting? Which part? That is all brain ache stuff. And it could actually increase anxiety, increase ill-being, and lead to the person shutting down more. Whereas actually saying, your mum is coming? You say your arm is hurting? The doors are locked? It's more often giving them back a cue, a prompt, that they will give you more information because the more they talk the more you'll get a clearer picture from them rather than relying on them to be factual and logical and being able to answer your questions. You want the maximum words from them to get a maximum picture. Help me! Help! Oh come on! <laughs> what we've seen in this film is that the woman in the flat was in a chronic state of anxiety 
And in that state of anxiety, it was very difficult initially to establish the truth. She gave some indicators. She talked about her mum. She talked about being locked in and she talked about her arm being hurt. And I would suggest that some, if not all of those things were metaphors for how she was feeling inside. Here's a summary of the key skills in dementia care. Always assess the feeling in the situation that you have arrived at. Make connection to the person with dementia first. Believe the person and what they are saying, even if it doesn't feel true. Understand their reality may be different from yours, but their reality is very real to them. Look out for control. Controlling care is a feature that creates ill-being in people with dementia. Act on poor care. You have a professional duty of care to report safeguarding concerns. Notice emotions. People with dementia are more feeling beings than thinking beings. Calm tension. People experiencing dementia pick up on the atmosphere and the aura in a situation. Educate everyone that behaviours in people with dementia always have a meaning. Following these simple messages will keep all ambulance staff focused on what matters most in dementia care. Perhaps the biggest risk that people living with dementia are at is the risk to their feelings of fear, trust, security. It therefore means that the biggest thing to achieve in being with someone with dementia is to create the relationship first before ever commencing on a healthcare investigation, assessment or task. And that therefore is my biggest message to ambulance crew. Create the relationship first, because it's through the relationship you'll get the best assessment. I do come away quite shocked at how some people are treated as if they've got no rights at all, as if they're an object, and, and, and I find that very distressing. If a person with dementia is making allegations to a 909 call handler about abuse, how do you expect the call handler to respond? So for our call handlers um, that may experience somebody claiming abuse, um, we would, we would refer somebody from a safeguarding point of view. All our staff are trained in, in safeguarding aspects. We would take that seriously. Any allegation that may have been said or that's been stated, because it may be implied, um, it may be something that's very subtle that that person has experienced. But we would always document that and make sure that that's sort of followed through because that person is, is in a vulnerable situation and, and we need to respect that for that patient. I would be reporting things such as if they're saying that they've been harmed in any way, we often have things where people might say, I've not eaten for a few days, um, I've not had any contact with anybody, and just kind of severe confusion. They're not really sure what's happening around them, maybe telling me that they're injured or um, have an illness that couldn't have possibly occurred just through them being in their, their property on their own. OK, is there someone there with you, David? In my experience, the main issues we would deal as far as safeguarding are concerned would be a breakdown in the care packages if family and friends are no longer coping or the care packages in place or the location that they live in is no longer suitable for the patient's condition. We've also had referrals as far as carers or people coming in have been taken advantage um, or there's been some kind of abuse or neglect um, and we've been involved 
being the person that's wrong for the clinicians on scene who are dealing with that and where they go next to report it. For all of us arriving at a care home, including ambulance crew, we need to be mindful of what we're seeing, hearing and feeling in the people around us and not just the person we've come to visit. Are people looking lonely and lost? Are people seeming to express feelings through their behaviours? Is the whole place seemingly focused on task rather than people? Does it feel somewhere you'd want someone you love to be? A particular thing is if people with dementia are expressing behaviours, calling out, trying to get out of chairs, and where that's going completely unnoticed. Ambulance crew need to be really vigilant to say to themselves, what is this culture of care that I've arrived at? Does it feel right? Does it feel somewhere that actually feels safe? Or should you also, besides the person you've come to see from a 999 call, be sitting with the manager and saying, I have some concerns from what I've seen, or even coming back afterwards and saying, there are issues in this home that left me feeling uneasy and I want to talk to colleagues about a possible safeguarding referral. Okay, so if you don't mind getting the notes for us, then we can go around and see the patient. Do you mind getting the notes for us while we go see the patient? Okay. Excellent. Beryl, Beryl, sit down. How many times have I told you? A strong example of a very serious safeguarding concern would be seeing people with dementia being controlled. By controlling behaviour, I mean controlling words or actions or even physical force, which suggests that people with dementia are not being treated with respect or dignity. Being treated as a body, being treated as a non-human being, being made to stay in a place, in a chair, being told what they can or cannot do. All of that will be a strong indicator of a much wider culture of care that's controlling. An ambulance crew have a duty of care to report any controlling care that they see during a 999 call to a care home. Safeguarding is very important in terms of people with the dementia because they're not able to look after themselves in terms of recognising the times that they're being abused, whether it's physically, emotionally or anything else to do with that. So it's in their interest for us as an ambulance service to look after them and make sure that their needs are best cared for. We had a, a carer rough handling an elderly gentleman who she was trying to get dressed and he was clearly uh, not happy to be dressed and she was throwing him around and we, we told her to stop doing what she was doing and to treat him with some respect. We did actually raise a safeguarding concern not just about him, but we, we, we had concerns about some of the other residents in this particular establishment. So we weren't happy with the treatment, the quality of care that, and the lack of dignity that was being uh, shown to, to, to this resident. So my concerns about the culture of care at a care home, I'd be looking at more of the staff rather than the patients. So I'd be looking at whether or not they're engaging with the patients, whether they're even around at the time. So while we're dealing with the patients, are they there supervising? Are they or are they nowhere to be seen? I would also be looking at whether or not their history of the incident was particularly coherent or um, accurately reflected what was going on at the time. You're looking for institutionalised ab abuse, so you know, have they got access to food, have they got access to water, are the staff saying, or the patient saying are they thirsty or I never get a drink or it's not coffee time yet, so I'm looking for all those little hints to say that you know, they're in a set time zone or they, they only get food when they're given it. When I walk into a care home, I like to know if it's clean, if it smells fragrant. Um, these are concerns. If it, if it doesn't smell particularly clean to me, I'm thinking, why is that? I look at patients in the lounge areas, see how they're communicating with other, or are they just left there or are they interacting with staff? And when you walk in, what does it look like? The general feel, um, the noise level, whether that's lots of screaming and shouting or whether or not there's laughter and talking and chatting. Um, uh, you know, if people are having a laugh and a joke and uh, people are smiling, that's normally a happy place. Well, I, I think I'll have this one. Oh, good choice. Yes. 
When you still think of dementia care, you might think of a place that's sterile, clinical, where the building feels like a mini hospital, people sat around the edges of the room, and that there's a general depressing air. Whereas what I'm seeing is the future of dementia care could be really, really different. Look, sound and feel like this, full of colour, energy, where people with dementia are doing bits of jobs in the past, feeling meaningfully occupied, and where they really, really come alive. It needs a care home to go on the journey towards really changing their culture of care. That usually involves completely changing the environment to make it look more domestic, to make it feel more like households. The analogy I always use is that people with dementia's world is coming in and in. And if that world is coming in and it's empty, then that's a metaphor for how we're feeling about people living with dementia. But if we fill that world up, the aim is to create closeness, busyness, where people with dementia feel they're doing things in the past, where they're living in the moment. And we call that being a butterfly, flitting, being still, touching people's lives in a few seconds. And I think all of us know in our gut whether a dementia care home has begun on that journey because it takes some time to achieve this. We're not saying all care homes should be reported for safeguarding if there's no signs of this. We're looking for care homes that have not at all begun this journey. We're looking for signs that the culture of care is still very oppressive and controlling, sterile and clinical. But most care homes are starting to realise dementia care could be really, really different. The safeguarding is, is interesting because obviously the front door was open. So when we've arrived, you know, we've immediately gone through to an open door. Hello, ambulance. We've gone down. She's pacing around. So to me, it's a little bit about her care package. So this is an elderly lady who, who has severe dementia by the looks of it. And so is her care package correct? Because obviously we've been called because she's distressed. So has she, is the actual right care in place with her? You know, is it actually safe for her to be left at home all day by herself? Yeah. Yes, Jack, he hurt me. The key safeguarding point that we picked out was the fact that she had an injury to her arm, which we believe to be a physical abuse that she sustained from her son. That was what she described to us. And then on top of that, she also described a, a neglect form of abuse in terms of being kept at home against her will. Uh, she described that with the doors being locked and not being able to get out. We would look to involve other agencies from both our end and the external agencies and try and piece together a bit of a puzzle of what's going on to try and branch the things that she's told us and try and match those with current reality and figure out what it is that's been going on with this lady. What I've seen from a range of ambulance staff is a staff team that are highly empathetic in their responses, huge amount of interpersonal skills, but also having to follow, as many professionals have, clear policies and procedures uh, with things laid out as to how they must approach situations. What I'm seeking is them to go one step further, to accept the policies and procedures, to actually stick with their empathy, but to hold on to the core belief that people with dementia are working from heightened emotions that the language of dementia is a language about feelings first and to find some way into that route in order to get a more accurate assessment. Here's a summary of the key skills in dementia care. Always assess the feeling in the situation that you have arrived at. Make connection to the person with dementia first. Believe the person and what they are saying even if it doesn't feel true. Understand their reality may be different from yours, but their reality is very real to them. Look out for control. Controlling care is a feature that creates ill-being in people with dementia. Act on poor care. You have a professional duty of care to report safeguarding concerns. Notice emotions. People with dementia are more feeling beings than thinking beings. Calm tension. People experiencing dementia pick up on the atmosphere and the aura in a situation. Educate everyone that behaviours in people with dementia always have a meaning. Following these simple messages will keep all ambulance staff focused on what matters most in dementia care. Achieving great dementia care is going to be everybody's business. One in three of us are going to be affected by someone living with a dementia. 
that's going to mean our families, our parents, our sister, our brother, as well as, as working in a professional role with people with dementia. This is a big national societal issue that's going to affect all of us. The future is about people with dementia being valued, unique members of our society. We don't want to be associated with the old cultures of dementia care, where people were warehoused, where people were seen as non-human beings. We want people with dementia to be part of our communities across the whole of the UK. And ambulance crews have a huge part to play in that. They will be called out to the medical emergencies first, but in the end, they'll also be able to reach people with dementia who are actually saying, I'm in a social emergency. They won't say those words, but they'll be saying and expressing a wide range of feelings which are indicating to ambulance staff, I need you to reach me in this moment.